The seeds which are planted in the heavens are sown by the hands of God's chosen ones. By the year of 1922, Hazrat Muslim Maud who had already exhibited such scholarly and spiritual feats as had never been seen before, further proving him to be a shining prodigy even among the brilliant companions of the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah and welcome to another episode of Ahmadiyat, Roots to Branches. I came merely to sow the seed. That seed has been sown by my hands. It will now grow and blossom forth, and none dare impede its growth. Ahmadiyat, the true Islam, is a flourishing tree. But this is not just any tree. This is the tree, the seed of which was sown under the guidance of Allah Himself through the hands of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian the promised Messiah in Imam Mahdi. Its miraculous growth in the midst of difficult and seemingly impossible circumstances is indeed a tale that is bound to increase one's faith, as if this is the tree that grew from concrete. Presently, under the guidance and leadership of our beloved Khalifa, Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmed, may Allah strengthen his hands, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat is now present and propagating the peaceful message of Islam in over 200 countries around the world. The Jamaat has built over 15,000 mosques, over 30 hospitals, and over 500 schools. It has translated the Holy Quran into over 70 languages. This is but merely a glimpse at the progress and a fraction of the achievements of Ahmadiyyat in only one single century. But this is Ahmadiyyat at present. Let us now take a step back and witness exactly how Ahmadiyyat, by the sheer grace of Allah, reached this point and attained these heights. For history is not only a means to understand and appreciate the present, but also a means to envision the future. Follow us on this journey. On today's episode of Roots to Branches, we will take a look at one of the most monumental years of Hazrat Khalifa Masih II, Razi Allah Anhu. By the eighth year of his spiritual administration, he had begun to reestablish such historic institutions as had not been seen since the time of Hazrat Umar, Razi Allah Anhu with the establishment of the International Majlis Ashura to an auxiliary organization for women, allowing them to become more active in the propagation of Islam in Ahmadiyya, to an invitation sent to the Prince of Wales and the establishment of a community in Egypt. Hazrat Muslim Maud Anhu's administrative abilities literally began boiling over borders. And with the state of the world turning worse and worse by the day, God the Almighty was preparing Hazrat Muslim Maud Anhu to take on such calamities in the world which would not only affect the world at hand, but humanity at large. Let's begin this episode by taking a look at a trip which Hazrat Muslim Maud took to Kashmir, as well as the publication of two great works. In the year 1921, Hazrat Muslim Maud upon medical consultation, embarked on a three-month journey to Kashmir, India. His journey started on the 25th of June, 1921, in which Hazrat Muslim Ma'ud visited many cities including Islamabad and the neighboring cities, but mostly focused his efforts on Sirinagar. During his stay, the people of Sirinagar benefited greatly from the presence of the Khalifa, and there were over 90 initiations that took place during this time. During his stay, Hazrat Muslim Ma'ud also started the Jalsa Salana in Kashmir, which also marked many speeches done for the Tarbiti issues of the people of Sirinagar and Kashmir. What's most mar- remarkable at this point also is to mention that Hazrat Muslim Maud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, along with his whole family visited Muhalla Yar Khan in which Hazrat Muslim Maud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, prayed at the tomb of Jesus Christ alayhi salatu The year 1921 was also a time of great scholarly achievement. Hazrat Muslim Maud ta'ala anhu, wrote a book called Aina Sadaqat 
in which he responded to some of the allegations made by Mawdi Muhammad Ali Sahib. Now in this book, Hazrat Muslim Ma'ud Anhu very boldly ended, saying that Ahmadiyyat was a plant which was planted by God Almighty alone. And there was no one that could uproot this plant because it was under the protection of God Almighty. He also said that him being a Khalifa was not because of any humanly effort, but because it was God Almighty who put him there. The second was a speech done in Jalsa Salana Qadian in the year 1921 by Hazrat Muslim Ma'ud Anhu, which was titled Hasti Bari Ta'ala. Hasti Bari Ta'ala, which is now in book form, spoke on the existence of God Almighty. And Hazrat Muslim Ma'ud Anhu in his speech spoke regarding what a man could do in order to witness God Almighty himself. And also spoke of many topics that were surrounding it, including what shirk was, including what it meant to associate partners with Allah the Almighty. And thus ended the year 1921 in the history of Jamaat Ahmadiyya. Near the beginning of the year of 1922, Hazrat Sheikh Mahmood Ahmed Saib Irfani anhu, received instructions from Hazrat Muslim Maud anhu, that he should make his way to Egypt and begin propagating the message of Ahmadiyya there. Now, before he left, uh, Hazrat Muslim Maud anhu, wrote him a detailed letter in which he gave him various advice regarding his trip. First, he said that the land of Egypt is very closely associated with the rise and fall of the world, as it has played its part in both. He further said that when you get there, take every step with caution and with prayers to God the Almighty, so that every step and every effort you make may be blessed. He then said that when you get there, try not to find other people of Indian origin, rather try to find Arabs who are educated, so that your Arabic may become proficient. He then said that you're going to a new place and you're a foreigner, and people will be looking at you and analyzing you much more. So ensure that your morals are of, a, are of a very high standard and that when you get there, you take in the good qualities of people and leave the bad. So with this, on February 22nd, 1922, Hazrat Sheikh Mahmood Ahmed Saib Irfani Razila Ta'ala Anhu made his way from India to Cairo, Egypt. As soon as he landed, he started under the instructions of Hazrat Muslim Maud Razila Ta'ala Anhu propagating the message of Islam in Ahmadiyyat. And by the grace of God, uh, you know, his efforts bore fruit and a community was established within Egypt. Now, he remained in Egypt until 1926. And during this time, he partook in individual tabli, which entailed speaking one-on-one -on -one with people and distributing flyers. Now, after 1926, uh, other companions such as Mulana Jalaluddin Sham Sahib Razila Anhu and Mulana Abu Lata Sahib Razila Anhu, they made their way to Egypt and they also propagated the message of Islam in Ahmadiyyat. And what they would do was have debates with various scholars, including scholars from the renowned Al-Azhar University. And what this did was, number one, it acquainted people with the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And number two, for those people who were beginning to move away from Islam, it began to bring them back towards the fold of Islam. And it was in this way that Ahmadiyyat was introduced and began to spread in the land of Egypt. It is the practice of the prophets of yore that they have frequently delivered their messages through writing as well as by word. For example, the Holy Quran tells us about the Prophet Solomon, that innahu Sulaimana wa innahu bismillahir rahmanir rahim, that this letter was written by uh, the, from the Prophet Solomon, and that uh, in fact it started uh, in the name of Allah with bismillahir rahmanir rahim to Queen Sheba. Then, of course, we know about the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who had various letters with his own seal delivered to the kings of his time and uh, prominent uh, authorities. Then we go to the time of the Promised Messiah والسلام, who was Jariullah fi hulul al-anbiya and colored in the mantle of all of the prophets. He also issued huge numbers of letters. In fact, he goes into the hundreds of thousands when describing numbers uh, in the Victory of Islam and in other, other publications as well. Hazrat Musleh Ma'ud radiallahu anhu being his spiritual successor, his spiritual son, even his physical son, took it upon himself to also pen down letters of invitation to not only clergymen, but also royalty. As such, Hazrat Muslim anhu wrote letters to people of the British dynasty and leaders around the world, um, from Syria all the way into Europe. And particularly, 
in the year 1922, he wrote a legendary letter to the Prince of Wales. Basa Sahib, if you could kindly elaborate uh, exactly what it was that happened um, as a result yes. and uh, some of the details that uh, the books of history tell us. Okay. Subhat Sahib, in 1922, the Edward VIII, the Prince of Wales, decided to visit the subcontinent India, which was at the time a colony of the British Empire, the Greater British Empire. And whereas the other Muslims were engaging in their own careless pursuits for popularity in the side of the British dynasty, forgetting altogether that they had a faith that gave them principles to follow, uh, Hazrat al-Muslim on the other hand, decided to courageously pick up the pen and put forth a letter, a document, as a gift to the Prince of Wales. Within it was a solid establishment and comparison of both the Muslim and Christian faith, and at the end, an invitation to Islam. And with this invitation, he had gone to the extent of giving a challenge, telling the Prince that he should encourage priests and other religious figures in the British Empire to come forth and test their capacity and acceptance of prayer in front of God. The answer to which Hazur said that we surely will be victorious in that. And this did not simply go in the annals of history forgotten. And even anti Ahmadiyya newspapers such as Zulafkar reported that we cannot remain but to admit and accept the courage with which the Imam of the Jamaat Ahmadiyya relayed openly and clearly the message of Islam in such, a, in such a powerful and robust way, inviting, in fact, one of the most powerful figures in the world towards the religion of Islam without any fear. If we look at the history of Jamaat Ahmadiyya, we see that during the time of the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam, and Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih Awwal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there were many organizations and auxiliaries that were made for the service of men, but they were not made for the service of women. So, on the 25th of September, 1922, Hazrat Muslim Aoud ta'ala anhu started the Lajna Imailah. He appointed Hazrat Amtul Hay Sahiba radiallahu ta'ala anha as the first president and secretary of this committee. But we see that Hazrat Amtul Hay Sahiba radiallahu ta'ala anha in the first meeting made Hazrat Umm Nasir Sahiba radiallahu ta'ala anha in charge of it. We see the services of Hazrat Umm Nasir Sahiba radiallahu ta'ala anha and we see that she very eloquently worked and headed this committee even till the last breath of hers. Hazrat Muslim Aoud radiallahu ta'ala anhu started Lajna Imailah with a letter to all the women of Qadian. And in this letter, Hazrat Muslim Aoud radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that just as the men have a responsibility in the propagation of Islam Ahmadiyyat, so do the women. And so all women should gain their knowledge in both the worldly and spiritually aspect. He also wrote that most of the enemies of Jamaat Ahmadiyya arise because the mothers of the enemies train them in such a way. So the women of Ahmadiyyat should train their own children in such a way that their children become proponents of Jamaat Ahmadiyya. Initially, 13 members joined the Lajna Imailah, and Hazrat Muslim Maud radiallahu ta'ala anhu made sure that there were weekly meetings held so that the training and empowerment of Lajna would continue. After this, Hazrat Muslim Maud radiallahu ta'ala anhu also started the Misbah magazine, which was made specifically for the empowerment and education of the Lajna Imailah. In the year 1928, Hazrat Muslim Aoud radiallahu ta'ala anhu added another branch to this auxiliary organization, which was called Nasiratul Ahmadiyya. The Nasiratul Ahmadiyya was an auxiliary made only for the young women of Jamaat Ahmadiyya and their transition into the Lajna Imailah. What's most interesting is if we look at the year 1944, we find a prophecy to Hazrat Muslim Aoud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. In this revelation, Allah the Almighty said to Hazrat Muslim Maud radiallahu ta'ala anhu that if at least 50% of the women of your Jamaat become empowered and trained in the teachings of Islam Ahmadiyyat, then Islam Ahmadiyyat will begin 
to grow very rapidly and the success of Jamaat would begin to shine. After the blessed institution of Khilafat in Islam, one of the most integral pieces of the spiritual puzzle in the Kingdom of God is Mushabarat, the consultation to the Khalifa by the people. In the time of Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, the establishment of this idea of shura, of consulting uh, or giving consultation and advice to the Khalifa on important matters became systemized in such a brilliant way that the annals of history is deprived and is left wanting of any sort of example. Of course, while this started in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad he would take mashura from the companions as well. It was Hazrat Umar anhu who set a foundation for uh, officiating this sort of consultation and systemized it. It was Hazrat Umar anhu who laid down the foundations of just how important shura is when he said, La khilafata illa bil mashwara. That there can be no true khilafat except that it should be with consultation of the people. And so in 1922, Hazrat Muslim anhu brought the entire scheme of shura and consultation to such a level that representatives from all over the world who were the most, or considered rather, the most righteous amongst the people and most well-versed, they would represent the masses and advise the Khalifa of the time on important and pertinent matters regarding faith and the future uh, of uh, the Jamaat as well. And so Shura came into being in his time. Now, what's very important to note is that the idea of Mashavarat, of Shura, has not only been there since the time of the Holy Prophet as a tradition, but it is founded in the Holy Quran. And so Hazrat Muslim Ma'ud radiallahu anhu, being the Muslim Ma'ud, also fulfilled establishing the commandment and several commandments that come about Shura in the Holy Quran in the earth. Through his hands, Allah Ta'ala ensured that this idea of Shura became a necessitating and facilitating factor for the victory of Islam. Basra Sahib, regarding uh, Shura, whenever we talk about it, we see it, you know, there was one uh, particular example of a, a, a guest who came to the, the Canadian Shura uh, who was a uh, Bosnian and uh, he is an, uh, not an Ahmadi. But when he saw Shura, he says, I have been to Syria, I have been to Damascus, I have been to the Blue Mosque in Turkey, I've been to so many different places. But he says, you guys, these were his words, he says, you guys are the future. He was so amazed at the systemization. And when I explained to him what Shura was, and he saw the, you know, the dozens and dozens of people that had gathered. And uh, when I told him that it was all to advise the Khalifa, uh, he was uh, so taken aback and awe-inspired. And so this one thing uh, led him to saying the words, uh, I have to be a part of this. But regarding the historical significance, what can you tell us about uh, in 1922? What exactly happened that uh, led Hazrat Muslim to do this? And, and how did it come to be uh, as we see it today? 1922, Sabah Saab was the year that Hazrat al-Muslih Ma'ud anhu finally decided to give a practical, administrative, and well-structured image system to the idea of shura within the Jamaat. And the first ever shura held on the 15th and 16th of April in the main hall of the Talim al-Islam High School in 1922 was the foundation, and for the first time, when the Khalifat al-Masih addressed his loyal, elitist advisory, which was to become the propagator of the truth in this era. We understand that the professionalism, the impeccable moral standard that went into creating Shura uh, is unheard of in the Muslim world. And to this, uh, we even have examples, as Sabah Sabsan just stated, uh, uh, the Bosnian individual. Uh, so to have a quick look at what Hazrat al-Muslim desired from the people that were advising him. The first 
The request he made to every member was that, before you come here, put your head down in front of your God. Seek his guidance and clean yourself of all and every last sliver of personal vendettas so that what you present to this Jamaat is purely for the collective progress of it. On this foundation, Hazrat al-Muslim continued in his speech and he said, and, and these words in fact open for us the, the mind and the heart of what al-Muslim desired from this shura. He said that it becomes difficult for me to see a day when this jamaat does not progress in strides and tells the members that to many of the people that may have uh, short sights into the future, they may see difficulties and trials and hardships in this. But he says, I tell you truly, that if you become the founding members of this system of shura, the progenies that will follow you will in fact find blessings in invoking felicitations and salutations on people like us. So with this in mind, the system of shura was established. This system, even when we look at it from a broader perspective within the Jamaat, uh, is beautifully corroborative of the other systems that exist. That is uh, the Sadr Anjuman, and previously the, the system of Amarat that had been established. What differed in Shura this time was that within Sadr Anjuman, it is the central system of executing orders from the Khalifa of Aq, who is the center of this entire Jamaat. And the Amarat system, on the other hand, is equally to keep the Khalifa of Aq aware of other administrative happenings at the local levels within the Jamaat. But Shura is when the Khalifa of Aq purely out of his own desire, asks the Jamaat to present their opinion. And Sabah Sahib, perhaps you can speak to this as well. Sure, Basra Sahib. Zakalai, I was thinking about uh, uh, one particular uh, notion that we misunderstand. When the Khalifa asks for our advice, we are not uh, advising him with this notion that uh, he has to take our advice. In fact, he asks us out of love because he wants to know our sentiments, our feelings when making these decisions. And so our consultation that he receives is more us participating in the decision that he would ultimately make, even if the decision is against uh, what we opined. Because self-interest, like you uh, well put uh, uh, earlier regarding Hazrat Muslim as well, um, is put to the side. And the decision made by the Khalifa is the absolute verdict. And we, out of the love for the Khalifa, just as out of love for us, he consults us, we accept whatever it is that he decides. And with that, we've come to the end of this episode of Ahmadiyyat, Roots to Branches. With the establishment of Lajnai Maila and the international Majlis Ashura, the planning spectrum for the victory of Islam had changed forever. Now the responsibility of advising the Khalifa was an international duty which lay with the ardent followers of the Khalifa of the time. And the role of women in the community grew that much more. And with the state of Western nations heading in a terrible direction, and the turbulence of the Shuddhi movement about to unleash upon the Muslim world, the internal safeguards which were established would prove to be fundamental pillars in uniting the community of the promised Messiah as had never before been seen. So with that, Jazakumullah for watching. Until next time, when by the grace of God, Ahmadiyyat will have branched out even further. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah.